So again, welcome. My name is uh, Stephanie Hildebrand. I work at the River Institute on the Great River Report in the visual content aspect of the project. Um, and I've been hosting Science Nature for the last two years. So before we begin, we'd like to respect, respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee. We offer our gratitude to the Mohawks of Akwesasne for their care for and teaching about our earth and all our relations. In honoring those teachings, we are committed to the process of dismantling the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism through good relations with each other and the land we live and work on. The River Institute was founded in 1994 in partnership with the Mohawk Council of Akwesasne. We are committed to listening to and working with our Haudenosaunee partners through all that we do. We are grateful for their time and knowledge that our neighbors graciously give us, and we strive to improve the health of the Great River and surrounding lands. This relationship extends into our personal lives as we get to know each other and build relationships outside our time at work and through a mutual interest in the health of the environment. For those watching online, if you don't live in Cornwall or on the Upper St. Lawrence River and you're curious whose land you live, work on, or you're visiting, you can visit native-land.ca and you'll find it there. Otherwise, another way you can find whose nation you're living on, uh, you can text your city and province to 1907-312-5085 and you'll get a text back telling you whose territory you're living on. So just uh, an, an announcement from uh, the Remedial Action Plan. Uh, they're working on the water quality and uh, seeking what the community is interested in knowing about the water quality for beaches, as there's been closures in the past. But this is um, improving, so we'd like to hear from you. You can go to stlawrenceriverwrap.ca. If ever you wanted to rewatch this presentation or past uh, science and nature presentations, you can go to riverinstitute.ca slash untapped. Otherwise, if you want to follow uh, any news coming out of the St. Lawrence River Institute, you can go to our social media. So for upcoming events for science and nature, we'll be back in person on uh, November 2nd. Uh, and it will also be virtual for those who cannot attend in person. Uh, we're going to have Dr. Jessica Dolan, who will be talking to us about Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe Ethnobotanical Atlas and Field Guide to Southern Ontario. I think this will be an excellent presentation and I would love to see you come again. And then otherwise we have our River Symposium coming at the end of this month on the 26th and 27th of October. The 26th will have the option of in person. If you're interested in coming in person, please uh, um, sign up or register ahead of time. There's a capacity of about 100 people uh, and it's filling up really fast. Otherwise, if you can't attend vir uh, in person, you can attend virtually. And the, the links to the videos will be on the website. And if you have any questions, you can ask Emily DeRoshi, who's standing at the back of the room. A lot of the programs and events that we have at the River Institute are generously uh, supported by donors. If ever you wanted to make a donation to the River Institute, you can do so at riverinstitute.ca slash donate. Otherwise, just talking to your friends about us or sharing any of our social media content goes a really, really long way. And so for tonight, we have Dr. Marianne Perron, who completed her bachelor at Laurentian University in biology with a specialization in restoration and conservation. E uh, conservation ecology. She then went to, on to complete her PhD in biology at the University of Ottawa, specializing in freshwater ecology with a focus on wetland ecosystems and dragonfly science. Dr. Perron joined the River Institute in 2020 as a MITAX postdoctoral fellow where she leads the scientific component of the Great River Rapport. She is currently leading a team of scientists to complete a series of technical reports on the 35 ecological indicators. So Marianne drove all the way from Kipoa, which is near North Bay. So everyone, please welcome Dr. Marianne Perot. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah? 
Okay, well, thank you guys so much for coming today. It's really nice to see you all. And I started my position at the River Institute just over two years ago. And I actually started two weeks before the pandemic hit. So I started this new job. I, you know, went to work for two weeks and then everything went online. So I didn't get the chance to actually meet a lot of you until now. So I'm really, really excited to be here. I'm super excited to meet all of you. I hope we get a chance to chat after the presentation. But without further ado, I'll get right into it. And today uh, we're going to talk about yellow perch and northern pike. So this, I just want to acknowledge my uh, supervisor, Dr. Lee McGahey, and she helped me with this presentation and has been a really great leader for the River Report project. And Stephanie Hildebrand, who does all the visual communication. So all the nice pictures you're going to see in the presentation are from Steph and the whole River Report team. So first of all, um, at, our project is framed in the Haudenosaunee Thanksgiving Address, or the words that come before all else. So we'll take a minute um, here. So our theme tonight is on fish. So we turn our minds to all the fish uh, life in the waters. They were instructed to cleanse and purify the water. They also give themselves to us as food. We are grateful that we can still find pure water. So we turn now to the fish and send our greetings and thanks. Now our minds are one. And this illustration here is from Victoria Ransom from Akrasosne. So I also want to acknowledge her amazing work. So I do know you guys don't know me, so I thought I'd give you guys a little introduction. Um, and really just to sort of let you guys know that I grew up, you know, not around here. I, I grew up about half an hour outside of North Bay, so it's about five hours uh, northwest of here. But my dad is a commercial bait harvester and a trapper. So I grew up fishing. I'm a fisherwoman. Um, and here, this is probably, I, I do think it's the biggest perch I ever caught. <laughs> so I'm pretty proud of it. Um, but I, I do have a, a deep connection to the environment. This is my dad. So I grew up going to work with my dad on wetlands. And um, this is the lake that we live on, Lake Nazwansing. And this is a bucket full of minnows. <laughs> so uh, we work really hard uh, for the family business. And I do know what it what it means to uh, have your livelihood depend on the health of the environment, not necessarily the St. Lawrence River, but I, I do come from a place of understanding. My dad encouraged me to go to school so I could have a bit of an easier life because bait catching is it's pretty hard and trapping. So I went to uh, Laurentian University, which is, was just an hour and a half away from where I uh, lived, and I had to pay for that somehow. So I was a leech trapper for four years. <laughs> So I commercially harvested leeches, and my dad calls it black gold because you can make a lot of money catching leeches. And I had my special ponds, and I knew those ponds so well. So I had you know, that local knowledge of, the, of these systems, and I know that you guys have that local knowledge of the St. Lawrence River. And I've been uh, studying the St. Lawrence River now for just two years, and I know you guys have generations of knowledge. So I'm here to hopefully answer some of your questions today, but I also hope that you have stuff you know, that, to teach me and give me feedback on what I brought together. And I hope you appreciate this work. And I guess we'll get into the presentation. So this is just a brief overview. So we're going to go through an introduction. We'll start off with the yellow perch, and uh, then we'll go to the northern pike and uh, with a brief conclusion. So um, I would. First of all, I'd like to thank you guys for your patience with this project. I know that a lot of you have been waiting years for some of these results. I hope you understand after I present to you that it took a lot of work to get all this information together. And I, I do hope that you continue to be patient because we have a lot more reports to get out. But I'm super excited to show you today what, what we found. So this report obviously could not be possible without our amazing team. So. Um, just take a, a minute here to look at, this is not everyone, this is you know, some of the current members, and just take a moment to realize uh, all the work that goes into this report. Also, can it be possible without our partners and collaborators? So the River Report was founded in partnership with the Mohawks Council of Akrasosne. So uh, I do really appreciate that partnership, and uh, they have become really great friends of mine too through this, this process. 
And um, I would also like to thank Abraham Francis, and uh, he has done a lot of work on these reports in particular, and just with the whole team, and also uh, the other members of the MCA, uh, like Kayla Sunday and Megan Mitchell, for example, and others. Um, but yeah, it's it's a really great partnership, and I hope that you know I could do you guys proud today. Also, you know, this work can't. You know, it's not possible without our funders, so thank you again for all of our funders. And the River Report, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, um, it's, a, it's an ecosystem health report for the Upper St. Lawrence River, and we have three main pillars to the report. So we have an indigenous knowledge component, we have a Western science component, and then we have our community or local knowledge component. And the region that we study um, spans from basically the Thousand Islands or Kingston all the way to the end of Lake St. Francis. So that's our area of focus. And these reports, so just to give you an overview of the process. So we have 35 indicators and these indicators were selected from you guys. So four years ago now, Lee McGaughy started uh, interviewing and sending out surveys. And we wanted to know what the community what they loved about the river and what they were concerned about. And from those concerns, we developed these 35 indicators and we brought them to scientists and we graded them and the northern pike populations and the yellow perch populations are two of the 35 indicators that we're going to talk about today. So these reports, basically, I'm not out there, you know, sampling, not yet anyway, but it's basically fundamental pieces uh, to what we already have the data for. So basically I go, so for yellow perch, for example, I do literature searches, I look at government databases, I get all the data I could find about yellow perch populations through time, and then I find out why are the yellow perch populations doing this or that. So if we look at our fish populations in the upper St. Lawrence River, this is from the 2020 gillnet uh, surveys. Yellow perch, and this is for the abundance, so the number of yellow perch, there's 42% of the gillnet surveys are actually yellow perch. So they're, they're the most dominant uh, fish in the pelagic zone of the river. And northern pike here, they make up 2% of all the fish in the river. And we want to know what is influencing these fish populations. So these five concerns here um, have been identified as global concerns. So what about these concerns? So climate change, pollution and contamination, land use, invasive species, and over-exploitation. How do those link back to our yellow perch and our northern pike on a local scale? And if we get right into yellow perch, so this is a beautiful photograph from Stephanie Hildebrand. Um, yeah, it's all the pictures here are really amazing from Steph. So yellow perch, as you guys know, um, they're native to the area or native to the river. They spawn in the spring. They love shallow, vegetated, and slow-moving uh, waters in the summer. They're schooling fish, so they're often found in groups. Uh, they, feed on, they feed on zooplankton and then switch to feeding on invertebrates and small fish as they mature. They are really important prey species uh, for our game fish and for uh, birds such as cormorants. And they're also very important, as you guys all know, for the recreational and the commercial fisheries in the river. So the main source of data that we found to represent sort of the relative abundance of yellow perch in the river is the gillnet survey. So uh, the New York, uh, the Ontario and the Quebec ministries all have a, a long-term gillnet biomonitoring program. And um, some of the river sections have, you know, New York and Ontario sampling them, or Ontario and Quebec. So there are basically three river sections uh, that we have data for. So the Thousand Islands region, um, the American waters is sampled by the New York State DEC, and the uh, Canadian side is sampled by the Ministry of Natural Resources, so the Ontario government. Um, Lake St. Lawrence is sampled by New York. Lake St. Francis is sampled by the Ontario Ministry and the Quebec Ministry. And if you look at these trends through time, so I just want us, uh, you guys to look at the axis here and realize that they're not all on the same time frame. But we have gillnet catch per unit effort. So that's basically the number of perch caught per net night. So they set their gillnets out, and this is the average number that they catch per year. 
you could see the in the Thousand Islands, the data starts in 1977. So that's our oldest long-term biomonitoring program. And we do see a decrease in yellow perch. In uh, the Ontario waters, the data only started being collected in 1989. So it, it does actually match up pretty well with what we're seeing in on the New York side of the waters. So if you were to sort of plop it in its time frame, you see that it does match up pretty well. In Lake St. Lawrence, we actually have like a slight increase in yellow perch uh, populations. And in Lake St. Francis, it's sort of all over the place here. If you look on the Ontario waters, we have a decrease, an increase, and then another decrease. And in the Quebec waters, it seems like we, we just have this like continuous increase. So it's actually sort of like opposing trends between that Ontario portion of Lake St. Francis and that Quebec portion of Lake St. Francis. So why? Why, you know, there, there's concerns from the public that the yellow perch populations are decreasing. So hopefully I could provide some answers today. So through some tips from uh, the public and the government agencies, uh, I looked into nutrients. So we know that nutrients have changed in the river. And when we look at those nutrient concentrations, so in specific total phosphorus, we see that from the 1970s or so, the, the nutrient concentrations have went down. And it, it has went down at a similar rate as yellow perch. So the nutrient, the total phosphorus concentrations here are in blue, and the yellow perch catch per unit effort here are in pink. So you do see they match up pretty well. Um, this graph at the bottom is just testing that relationship. So it's basically telling you when you have a lot of phosphorus in the system, you have a lot of perch in the system. When you have less phosphorus in the system, you have less perch in the system. So yellow perch really follow this sort of bottom-up control. And where is all this phosphorus coming from? So there has been studies that looked at um, sediment cores and determined phosphorus concentrations through time, so through hundreds of years. And if you look at some of the models that go back to the 1800s, there was a period of nutrient enrichment in Lake Ontario and the other Great Lakes between the 1940s and the 1970s. And that phosphorus or those nutrients uh, mainly came from domestic sewer systems and phosphate-based detergents that are now banned, but in you know, the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and 70s, they were a big problem. So these domestic sewer systems and these phosphate-based detergents were adding a lot of nutrients to Lake Ontario and uh, in consequence also adding a lot of nutrients to the river, to our part of the river anyway. So when, so when you look at those nutrients through time, that period of nutrient enrichment was really from the 1940s to the 1970s. And our gill netting program started in the 1970s, the late 1970s in the Thousand Islands. So you see here that our long-term biomonitoring programs actually, actually seem to have started when uh, the river was added, had the most nutrients that it's ever had. Um, and if you look at, so this is commercial harvest in Lake Ontario and the Upper St. Lawrence River through time. So it starts in 1913 and it goes all the way to 2015. And you see here that the river, based on this data, the yellow perch populations are decreasing from the 70s, but they're actually sort of returning to the levels that were seen prior to nutrient enrichment. So as you can see here, the catches were low. They followed this sort of, there is a leg. You know, it does take time when you get nutrients in a system, it takes time for those nutrients to get assimilated and to, you know, go up the food web to the purchase. So there is a leg here, but when there a, was a lot of nutrients, so when we didn't have good treatment systems for the sewers, we had these uh, detergents that added lots of phosphorus to the system, the perch actually, they love that. They, you know, they thrive in that environment because it produces lots of plants and uh, invertebrates and stuff that they eat and the habitats that they live in. But when we decrease those nutrients, because there were some uh, nutrient ab abatement programs. So in 1972, the Great Lakes uh, signed a water quality agreement and 
the goal was to get total phosphorus down to a certain limit. So they wanted to remove these nutrients, so get uh, treatment on the sewers and you know ban those phosphate detergents because they were getting a lot of algae blooms in Lake Ontario and the other Great Lakes. So by removing those nutrients from the system, the yellow perch are, are responding to that. So that they are going back down to the level that they probably were before that period of nutrient enrichment between the 40s and the 70s. So the bottom line is when it comes to yellow perch, the status of the river has changed. So we went from a system that was historically didn't have a lot of nutrients. So you see here the yellow means low nutrients and the red means high nutrients. So we went from a system that didn't have a lot of nutrients to a system that had too many nutrients. And now we're back to a system that doesn't have many nutrients again. And when we look at that and how it affects the carrying capacity of the river, so the carrying capacity is basically the amount of, in this case, yellow perch the river can support. So if you don't have all those nutrients in the system, you don't have enough resources to support the high perch populations that we saw in the 70s, for example, or the 60s or the 50s. So this is just an infographic here to show you that the perch really did respond to this bottom-up control. So the nutrients were controlling their population size, and still are. But there are other pieces to the story, and um, when, when you look at a, an ecosystem, there's these cumulative effects. So there's a bunch of different things that interact with each other that causes these trends. So we do know, you guys probably noticed, there's a lot of cormorants around these days. Uh, in the 1980s, there was a population surge of the double-crested cormorant. And their main food source used to be yellow perch. So half of their diet was yellow perch. And you could imagine if we had this huge increase of cormorants, that puts a lot of pressure on yellow perch too. The thing about that is when the invasive fish species came in, the round goby, the cormorants completely shifted their diet from yellow perch to round goby. So you could see here that before the round goby came in, these cormorants ate you know, 50% of their diet were perch. And after the round goby came in, that went down to 20% of their diet. So that is a pretty big shift. And now round gobies make up 70, you know, actually 50% of their diet, they completely shifted. So between the perch and the round goby, that makes up 70% of their diet. So th there was a big, there was pressure from the cormorants on the yellow perch, but that pressure has somewhat been alleviated by the introduction of the round goby. So the cormorants are feeding a lot on round gobies these days. And if we look a little bit closer to remember the, that, that different relationship that we saw in Lake St. Francis between that Ontario portion and that Quebec portion. So this is the Ontario portion in red and the Quebec portion here is in blue. And I just sort of plotted the data on the same graph here just to show you that difference. It, it took some digging and I'm not sure I, I have it 100% uh, correct maybe, but I'd love to hear what you guys think about this. Uh, the one major difference between that little Ontario portion and um, that Quebec portion uh, is management. You know, the, the Ministry of Ontario manages their waters a lot different than the Ministry of Quebec. In particular, there is a commercial fishery in that Ontario portion of the lake and there's no active commercial fishery right now in that Quebec portion of the lake. So there are differences. If we take a closer look at that Ontario commercial fishery, we see that in 2010, the quota for yellow perch was raised threefold. So they raised the quota in 2010 and it has remained high ever since. If you look back at this year, we had peak in 2009, peak in 2010, and after 2010, the yellow perch populations in that Ontario portion of the lake started decreasing. And that's the one difference that I do see between the Ontario and Quebec portions. Are yellow perch that local that there's that big of an effect on it? I'm not 100% sure. I'm not 100% convinced yet, but it is the one difference I found, and we will have that next data point. They're doing the sampling right now, actually, for the, that Quebec portion. So it's going to be interesting to see if it keeps going up or if it's going down, and maybe it's just a delayed effect. 
So commercial fishery is a difference between um, that Ontario portion and Quebec portion of the lake. However, when you look at the commercial fishery, the impact of the commercial fishery to the impact of the recreational fishery, it's, you know, it's like a speck of dust basically. So the recreational fishery is in light blue and the commercial fishery is in dark blue here. And this is the biomass, so the amount of pounds of yellow perch harvested just in that little Ontario portion of Lake St. Francis. So you can see that that commercial fishery is, is nothing substantial to the recreational fishery. So maybe the perch are you know, at a tipping point in that small portion of Lake St. Francis and that increased quota is just sort of driving them past what they can handle in terms of harvesting. But we do, we do have to really look at our recreational fishery here and, and see that you know, over 100 pounds of yellow perch in that small portion of the lake, that's a lot of perch to, to come out of the lake. But it has been declining and it's following the gillnet trend. So we do see a decline in the amount of yellow perch you're catching in the gillnets. And we see a similar decline in the number of perch caught by recreational fishermen. So the big recommendations for yellow perch is maybe to adjust the fishery limits to support that new carrying capacity. So we know that nutrients are still declining in the river. We have the invasive mussels now that are taking out even more nutrients from the water. So it might be time for us to sort of relook at those fishery limits and try to adjust them to support the new carrying capacity given that we don't has, have as much nutrients as we used to have in the river. Secondly, to do further research on uh, why the catchers are so different between that Ontario and Quebec portion of Lake St. Francis, I'm really interested to know why that is and we will have some more data this year. So hopefully we could look a little bit further into that. And thirdly, to uh, pay careful attention to the yellow perch recruitment rates. So those young of the year yellow perch are going to tell us how the perch stocks are doing. So that, to take a closer look at those and make sure that those are, are good. And they are good in the Quebec portion of Lake St. Francis. Now moving on to Northern Pike, which is a bit of a different story. We, you guys probably know that yellow perch and Northern Pike are both, their populations are both going down, but th they are for very different reasons. So Northern Pike, as you guys know, again, uh, they're top predators in the river. Uh, they're a cool water species, so they are, you know, sensitive to changes in temperature. Uh, they spawn in the spring, so they're, you know, one of the first fish species to spawn as soon as the ice is out. They prefer to spawn in inundated, shallow, sheltered, vegetary tributaries, tributaries and shorelines. Um, they're phytophiles, and that means that they love plants. Like, pike need plants to survive. They, their eggs are semi-adhesive, so they actually have a type of glue sort of on them that sticks to plants. So when pikes lay their eggs, they stick to plants and the plants hold them above the sediments so that they have enough oxygen to develop. So they, they have this really nice relationship with plants. Uh, they're also opportunistic feeders and they, they feed mostly on fish, but they could also feed on frogs, crayfish, even uh, ducklings. And if we look at the trends, it's not, you know, it's not like the perch where we see a, a bit of different trends. We, we, we see the same story across all three sections of the river. The northern pike aren't doing good in the upper St. Lawrence River based on this data. So we see the Thousand Islands, a decrease in the Thousand Islands in both data sets. We see a decrease, maybe not as drastic, in Lake St. Lawrence. And we see a pretty uh, substantial decrease in Lake St. Francis in both that Ontario and that Quebec portion. So why is that? Well, the commercial harvest data, it's not showing the same story that it showed for the yellow perch. They're so far up in the food chain, they're not getting that uh, bottom-up control like the yellow perch are. They're top predators, and it looks like they've been, their populations have been decreasing for the past 100 years at least. Fishermen aren't catching as much pike either. So this is recreational fishery data for the Lake St. Francis. And you can see that it's really, it, it hasn't been, based on these surveys and this data, it, the, pike fisher, the pike fishery hasn't been doing too good recreationally. So why is that? So based on, there is a lot of research out of uh, the Thousand Islands Biological Station, so John Farrell's lab, and what they've come to is that 
there's not any more good spawning habitat for northern pike in the upper St. Lawrence River. And why is that? For two reasons. The first reason is because our wetlands are being converted. So pike, as I mentioned, they like to later eggs in inundated basically vegetation. So that's when you get those spring floods. Uh, the water goes over that vegetation and there's a bit of flooded vegetation. They lay their eggs in that shallow flooded vegetation basically. But cattails and Phragmites and other robust emergent plants have really taken over our wetlands. And they've been taking over the wetlands for the past hundred years as well. So there is these paleo records, which is basically they take a big core, they get a bunch of dirt from uh, these wetlands, and then they look at the pollen in that sediment core and they could go back a certain amount of years. And basically, uh, cattails, there was a big shift in wetland as soon as uh, monoculture agriculture was a thing. Uh, back, you know, over a hundred years ago. So when settlers came on and started deforesting the land, uh, growing monoculture agriculture, we got a spike in cattails. So that land clearing had some kind of an effect on the cattails uh, to allow them to encroach on other wetland types. So northern pike love wet meadow habitats. They can't lay their eggs, as you could probably imagine, on those big cattails. So here is a paper a uh, figure from Wilcox et al, 2008. And the gray is cattails and the black is meadow marsh. So the black is where pike love to lay their eggs or need to lay their eggs and the gray is where they can't lay their eggs. At the top here, so this is two different wetlands in the Thousand Islands. The top here is 1959 and you could see that there was a lot of black in 1959, so that's good. Same thing with this wetland. At the bottom is 2001. Do you see where that, there's not much of that black color left, right? There's not many meadow marshes remaining in the upper St. Lawrence River for the Northern Pike to lay their eggs on. So that's a huge problem for them because these cattails grow in really dense monocultures, as you guys probably noticed driving along the river. And as I mentioned, that has been going on for over a hundred years now. The other factor that affects their spawning habitat is water levels. And that has to do with uh, the operation of the Moses Sanders power dam. So the power dam, um, it actually encourages a hybrid type of cattail. So it's called Typha ex gloca, and it's a more invasive species. So it, it is really successful. So those water level changes encourages that more successful cattail to develop. Um, in the wetlands, and it also affects the water level. So remember I said that the pike need those flooded areas? Those areas aren't flooding anymore. So this is uh, two graphs. So this is upstream of the dam, and this is downstream of the dam. Uh, the dotted line is before the dam went in, so the water levels before the dam went in, and the black line is the water levels after the dam started operating. So most of the research, as I mentioned, for northern pike comes from upstream of the dam. And you see here that the seasonal variation in water levels hasn't changed hugely. This is in Brockville. But if you look at these lines, so these basically these bars that go um, vertically is the standard. It's called the standard deviation. It's basically the variability in that water level. So you can see here that when the dam went in, that variability in water level changed. And we no longer get those years where we, we get high water levels. And those are the years that the pike do the best. So most of the eggs hatch, pike recruitment is super successful. So they got rid of those years of really high and really low water levels. So that affects northern pike reproduction. Downstream of the dam, it, it's even worse. There has not been, you know, much research on northern pike downstream of the dam. So that is a big data gap. But I suspect that the pike are probably doing even worse down here with the water level changes. So not only did the dam get rid of the seasonal variation, so we no longer have spring floods. You can see here, so just a reminder, the dotted line here is before the dam went in, the water levels pre-dam, and the black line here is the water levels post-dam. So you can see here, before the dam went in, you had high water levels until basically July. 
when the dam went in, there's a dr the water levels decline after March. And northern pike spawn as soon as the ice is out, so they start spawning usually in April. So they don't have those flooded areas downstream of the dam to spawn in. There has not been a lot of research on them downstream of the dam, but um, these water levels are a big problem, and the cattails encroaching in the wetlands is a big problem for the pike. So the pike have in the St. Lawrence or the upper St. Lawrence River, they're very particular. Um, because they don't have any areas to spawn, they actually have a really long spawning period now. So it's called a protracted spawning period. And this is research again from the Thousand Islands. So we could sort of generalize it to the area here. And I, I think that is probably hop happening down here, but we need more research to confirm that. But pike usually uh, spawn in tributaries and shallow bays. So here is just when uh, it's an average based on a model from John Farrell of when the pike spawn in the Thousand Islands. So typically most pike will spawn in tributaries and shallow bays between April and May. Pike in the river are laying their eggs in these really deep habitats because there's no connectivity to those shallow flooded areas because of the cattails or those shallow flooded areas just don't exist anymore. So they're laying their eggs in these deep habitats and these deep water habitats take a long time to warm up. So one of the cues for the pike is water temperature. So they need a certain water temperature to activate them to go and lay their eggs. So they're waiting for these deep habitats to warm up. So it's extended their spawning period into June into the river. And, and this is where I would really like your feedback. Are you seeing any pike, you know, that are you know, have eggs in them in late May or early June. Um, the thing about this is that these eggs aren't surviving very well. So these deep littoral habitats are considered ecological sinks. So they'll lay their eggs in them, but they don't have the necessary requirements to hatch and become successful young of the year pike. So that's one of the issues that we're seeing. And that's probably why the northern pike populations are going down so much. They're not, they're not, they don't have a good chance in reproduction in the upper St. Lawrence River anymore. So the recommendations out of the report for this is to really protect that spawning period. So we know that it's a really sensitive time for them. So we should be doing everything we can to protect, protect. And you know, it does extend quite long into June even, but we should be doing what we can to protect that sensitive period of time to give them the best chance that they can have to reproduce and to get their populations back up. Secondly, wetland restoration. I am a wetland scientist and you know, this is maybe a soft spot for me, but we need to uh, manage these cattails um, and we need to conserve the habitats that don't have a lot of cattails in them now or habitats that we know pike are successfully spawning in. So we need to make sure that those habitats remain healthy. And thirdly, because we don't have a lot of data downstream of the dam, I do think we need to fill that data gap and see are northern pike sort of acting the same way down here as they are up in the Thousand Islands. So basically, in conclusion, uh, the river is changing. Uh, not necessarily for the better or for the worse, but it's changing. Um, in particular with yellow perch, the nutrient loads are affecting the populations of yellow perch. So the yellow perch populations are going down but I don't know if it's necessarily a, a bad thing in some cases, just because the river is sort of returning to what it was before we had all those nutrients. So we have to readapt. In terms of Northern Pike, our wetlands are degrading along the upper St. Lawrence River. And it's really important to protect the wetlands that we have and try to restore the ones that have been altered by the cattails. So there are management programs that we could do to try to get rid of some of those cattails. So I'd like to thank you guys, the community members, because you brought these you know, issues to our attention and, uh, and all your feedback that you've given us so far, and hopefully that you'll continue to give us. So this is, you know, this is what I found based on the last couple years that I've been working on it, but you know, it's an open discussion. So let me know what you guys think about what you heard today, and the door is always open to look into other things as well. I'd like to thank the data providers, so it's, you know, a big job trying to get all this data together from the ministries and whatnot. 
So thank you for all of those who have been um, helpful. The reviewers on the report. So we do have some external reviewers looking over this stuff. Uh, Schnitzel's Pub for hosting the event. Our partners, our funders, and the whole River Report team. And with that, I'd like to thank you guys for coming. And if you have any thoughts, questions, feedback, I'll do my best to answer your questions uh, now if you have any. So thank you. because of the high levels in the Ontario lakes and the other lakes when they opened the dam wide open at Saunders. And this was just, I believe, two years ago. They had that water flow like we've never seen it. And that washed away a lot of the spawning that was going on. And the Comorant population as well, like you say, they're after the gobies now. But with the perch decrease as it is, then their diet would have to change because the goby population has gone ridiculous and the perch population has tanks. So obviously their diet will change. So it's not that they are really changing their diet. I believe is that the species they were targeting is just not there. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. And yeah, there's more gobies now than there are perch. So it's, oh, yeah. yeah, it's, can someone write, someone, someone from the River Institute write down some of these points? Yeah. Yeah, because I don't have the best memory, but that, that is a really good point. And I, I, I didn't think about the water release. So we will look into that and it, it definitely does have an impact, I'm, I'm sure. So. Right, right. Yeah. And just one last point, if yeah. I may. So as far as the pike goes, in this, uh, I come from the Summerstown area, right at the edge of Lake St. Francis. So we do catch pike, my brother and I, we do. We don't keep them, it's always catch and release. Uh, and my cousin runs, I believe your daughter would know this, uh, runs the pike tournament every year for cancer mm. fundraiser at the Blue Anchor. And he's been doing this for eight years. And I don't know uh, what, what Emily saw as far as a change in uh, what they're catching, but we've caught pike in the shallows and released them. And to me, it hasn't really changed as far as the pike that we've caught over the last few years. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I'm just trying to see if I have, I do have some data from those fishing tournaments. I just don't okay. know if I've okay. included them. Because there, if the perch is dropping, obviously your, your pike population is going to drop just from the perch not being there for them to feed on as well, right? Yeah, for sure, for sure. So I do have some data for the pike tournament and it has been decreasing, but it's hard to tell, right? Because that it could be, you know, ugly weather that day and not as many fishermen come out or like stuff like that. So it's hard to sort of get trends from that um, data, but, but it is, yeah, it is interesting. And, and when you, are you, do you fish in that tournament? Uh, we have in the past, not every year, but we have, and I'm in close contact with Mitch, which is always the one running it. Great. And uh, they do have records as far as the weights brought in. Like yeah. They, they have all the fish weights. Yeah. I, how many caught. I do have some of that data too, and I'm wondering wh when you guys are doing that tournament, do you do you see that the pike are still <coughs> spawning, or because we don't have the data down here to, to tell when the, the spawning season is? Yeah, he might be the one to ask because we don't cut them open, so mm -hmm. you wouldn't know. Unless, okay. Right, unless you. Yeah. Unless you keep the fish. Yeah, for sure. I don't know if them as uh, if they've kept any to open them up and. Uh, yeah. But yeah, we, we will, like, I'm interested to, to hear if you guys find some pike, you know, spawning in May, June. Like, it's, it's important for us to protect that, you know, that period of time. So I'm interested to know anyway. But good, what's your name? Uh, 
Victor, Victor Day. Thank you, Victor. Yeah, yeah. And we're right next to Cooper's Marsh. I don't know if you know Cooper's Yeah, Marsh. I do. Okay. Yeah. Right. Perfect. I, I dragonfly, did some dragonfly catching in there. Okay. <laughs> it's interesting that you're saying that the cattails are creating a huge problem. Well, he's been doing his fair share. <laughs> yeah, so he's been moving. Yeah. yeah. So where he lives, he's been trimming back a lot of the cattails. Yeah, and it's. So if it is affecting, you know, a spotting for the pike to come in and. Seems so like, what, yeah. What vegetation would they typically use? Yeah. When they lay their eggs and. I should, sorry, I think I need to repeat the questions, eh, for the people online. So the question was, um, what kind of vegetation do northern pike use to, to lay their eggs? It's usually like flooded graminoid, like grasses and sedges that they, they'll lay their eggs on. The, and it's, you know, it's only flooded for the spring and then the waters go down. Anything that's sort of below the, the water surface, so they lay their eggs and the eggs fall on the, on the grasses and it, and it brings them above the sediments. So cattails, like you can't, they can't even swim to the shore when all those cattails come in. And they obviously can't lay their eggs on them. So it is a big problem. And, and I have some ideas, you know, on how to maybe help that situation. Like you look at what eats cattails, muskrat. And it doesn't seem like our muskrat populations are doing great in the river because of the water levels. Um, so, you know, maybe encouraging some muskrats would help the, the cat. I have lots of, you know, ideas and stuff, but yeah, the musk encouraging muskrats and getting their populations up and stuff. Anyway, upstream, that's where we have the data upstream that the muskrats aren't doing well. So that would be one way to manage, you know, a natural way to manage the cattails. Maybe a comment on the yellow perch. Uh, there's a lot of, I see quite a few clients that are fishermen and hunters, and they're saying they're seeing perch in areas with their active views where the perch should not be. So in really deep water. So probably four or five years ago, they're in 54 feet of water. Wow, in the summer, eh? Wow. So they're saying, well, what are the perch doing there, right? So then they started thinking that possibly, because you mentioned the cormorants feeding on perch, that the perch are actually retraining themselves to go into deeper pockets of, of water. And as you mentioned, that the pike are starting to spawn down there, and the pike feed on perch as well, right? So it's, that could be impacting the population of perch. Yeah, everything's connected. And, you know, it's, I, I can't give you an answer as to why they're found that deep, but it, it is unusual. And um, I think that this is also a story where we're going to be working on the walleye report soon. And I, I think the walleye are changing where they like to hang out too. So hopefully there's more to come on that. But I, I'm going to take that point down to the perch in the deep water. And I'll look, try to look into that a little bit and see why. Thank you. I was just wondering, uh, we know that smallmouth bass, and we know that large perch both eat a lot of gobies. Is that the case with pike also? Do they eat more gobies now than they used to? So I, I haven't come across a study that looked at that, and I could just have not read a study that looked at that, and there might be one out there. But I'm sure, you know, pike are opportunistic, right? Yeah. So I'm sure that whatever they have the chance to eat, and if that probability increases with, you know, the increasing abundance of round goby, which we have done the round goby report, hopefully next presentation we could present it. But the round goby abundance is, you know, it's going up. So I would assume that probably the pike are also feeding on round goby more these days. I can tell you that they are, they are feeding on goby. I was out fishing today. And uh, right now this perch, I've never seen that many perch, but they're, they're, they're this small. They're, they're yeah. small, yeah. And gobies, 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 they drive you nuts. <laughs> anyway, I, you know that it's gobies because when they bite, it's like they shiver, you know. <laughs> so I'm, I'm bringing one up. And there's a pike that came after it, grabbed it, didn't grab the hook. And I tried to bring it up, but it took the goby. The oh. goby was on, and so was the pike. So they are feeding on gobies. Okay. And I don't know if there's that many gobies down at the bottom, because I know there has to be millions, because they eat it's gotta be. worms uh, in half an hour. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, so how come that pike came up? Like we were, I don't know, 12, 12, 14 feet of water. That, that pike came up to grab that goby, and he got it. 
That's good to know. So they, they are eating gobies and yeah, they're opportunistic, right? They'll, they'll eat whatever they can, the pike, and they're, they're so ambush. It's the, first, yeah. it's, the, it's the first pike that I see okay. in, I don't know, five, six years. Wow. And last year I only went out fishing 31 times. So, <laughs> you know, and I, did, I didn't see one pike. Yeah. But I must, must, have, I must have caught a million gobies. Yeah, and well. So, but I squashed them. <laughs> and, then, and then what happens is that the seagulls come down. Right? Yeah. Because like, the gobies are on top of the water like that, and the, go the seagulls, they just come down. And yeah, and you're feeding, down, so. you're feeding the birds, so, so yeah. We, we need more seagulls. Yeah. <laughs> Our, yeah you, you know, we do have a herring gull uh, indicator, too. We have lots of stuff. We, we got a lot of work ahead of us, but, yeah. What, what was your name? Ron. Ron. Good comment, and, yeah. Definitely, we'll write that down too. <laughs> uh, with regards to the breeding of the pike, the, the spotting beds, if um, in, in the Ontario side, along the St. Lawrence River, we have no more riffling beds because everybody, we've allowed ourselves to build and to block off all the riffling beds. So basically the only hope that the pike have is to go up either a municipal drain or one of our small creek ways, right? Mm -hmm. And um, if, if they're, you're, what you're saying is if those creek beds and the, the, the municipal drains are not allowed to flood up, um, the demise of the pike is not looking like it's not looking like it's going to survive. We're going to catch up. They're going to die of old age, and that'll be the end. Like, what control measures do you actually see that we could do? If Cooper Marsh won't do it. I mean, it's <laughs> too small. It's one little area. Mm -hmm. We have no other marshes in the area. Yeah. Right? So, like, the Quebec side, yeah, thanks mm -hmm. to Aquasocity, they have a lot yeah. of wetlands, but we don't on this I know. side. So, the, and this is, again, this is my opinions mm -hmm. of what we can do uh, based on, you know, my analysis of the data and reading the literature. I think, like, it's important now more than ever to s conserve the places that we know that they are spawning and any meadow marshes that are left, make sure that nothing happens to them. Um, control the cattails and if you know there are muskrats like I said there's also mechanical removals and there was a study in the Thousand Islands where John Farrell uh, removed channels in the cattails so the pike could get to shore and it was a success and the, the young of the year went up um, so there's hope I also think the water levels need to be adjusted and we we need that spring flood um, and it's not just for the pike you know, it's for a lot of other animals that we need. That, we need that natural water cycle. And I do understand that it might not be possible to get that natural water cy cycle anymore, but something that has, you know, the economics and the ecological balance, um, the best we could do, it, it, it might be, you know, worth revisiting those natural water levels, protecting our wetland habitats, trying to control these monocultures of cattails because that too is not just affecting northern pike. When you get all one species in one area, it reduces the diversity of all the other plants in the area. And animals need plants. Lots of animals, they depend on plants to complete their life cycle. So without that diversity of plants, Lots of you know animals might not use cattails, and they might need other species of plants. You're you're getting rid of a lot of other animals as well, so it's it's really trying to increase that plant diversity in the wetlands, protect the wetlands, and trying to get that water cycle a little bit better than it is now. That's what I would suggest anyway. That's, that's, <laughs> that's correct, you know, because just east of Pilos Point, uh, there's a bay there. When we were younger, we used to call that Nuns Bay. And you go in there with just a paddle, you turn the motor off, and you see the pike all over the place. Now, none. None. Yeah, and, and, and you know, there's, there's, there's different things there that, because there's overpopulation. Because of the park that's there now, when I was younger, there was no park there. So now with all that traffic that comes in and out of there all the time, that's, that doesn't help. Yeah, it, but you can't stop that. Yeah, and you know that's why it's important to keep that development away from the wetlands that are still, you know, in good shape. There are still some, so it's really important to save those areas that are left. Um, 
yeah, wetlands are really important and we need to save all the wetlands we can along the river. Um, are you in close contact with the Ministry of the Environment? Like, I know they support you, but are they actually, is, are they, are you bending their ear where they're actually giving you any sort of uh, path forward, as, as you would say? Yeah, so I have, you know, you know, put the, the bird in their ear for some of these things, and they have been actually really receptive to, to listening to me. Um, which has been nice. They, um, some of my recommendations, you know, these reports are just being finalized now and we actually have a paper that we're working uh, on about the perch and the nutrients and everything. And the more we get this stuff out there and that's published so they, that they could cite it, that's what we're, we're working to do right now. I will say that they have been really, uh, you know, they have listened and I'll keep, I'll keep talking and you know, telling them what we're finding and hopefully it could make a difference. And it's, it's, you know, it's your job as the community too, to, there's a power in numbers, you know? Mm -hmm. So the more that you guys learn and the more that, you know, I learn from you guys, hopefully the more we could improve the Upper St. Lawrence River. How, is that, how exactly does the phosphorus affect uh, the perch, the change? Yeah, so there was a study, so I don't know if you guys are familiar, but in Lake St. Pierre, so just downstream uh, past Montreal, they had a complete collapse of their yellow perch populations. And there's been a moratorium in that lake since 2012, and the perch still haven't uh, been able to make a population that's self-sufficient. So, there's, so they have done a lot of studies in that lake and it is different because we're more, in our section, we're more influenced by Lake Ontario. They're more influenced by the tributaries and by you know the outflow of Montreal and whatnot. But what they found was that in those areas that have, uh, that nutrients are decreasing, the basically there's less weed beds and plants and perch love to hang out in the weed beds. And in those weed beds, the per that's the perch's food in there. So because that phosphorus or those nutrients, it's, plant it's food for plants and it's food for invertebrates, those perch don't have those resources when there's not a lot of nutrients. So with a certain amount of nutrients, you could only uh, support a certain amount of perch. And it's not a bad thing, it's just it's that proportion, right? Of, okay, you have X amount of phosphorus in the system, so you could support X amount of perch. And because we signed that Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, and it's a good thing that we're not dumping raw sewer in, the, in Lake Ontario in the river anymore, but that sewer was actually food for a lot of you know, animals in the river. And, and it's bad for some species and it's good for other species. So for perch, they're a winner in those situations. They're generalist species and they're really tolerant species. So yeah, by removing uh, those sources of nutrients, we the, the yellow perch don't have any food or ha not as much food and habitat Basically as they used to. Because you're putting less fertilizer. Right? E exactly. So it's not, you know, it's not a bad thing because we have all these treatment systems now and we're cleaning the water out. And, and like, you know, if you look at that graph, the river is not supposed to have a lot of nutrients in it. It used to have, so this is yellow. It used to have really low nutrients and we're back to yellow now. It was just that period of time where we, we were orange and that's that period of time where we didn't have those treatment systems for the sewers, that we had those phosphate-based detergents that were going in. So yeah, it's just we just got to get used to the new norm, I guess, and, and realize, I guess, how do we see the system and, you know, is it okay that, that the yellow perch are going down and can we adapt our ways to support the new population size of perch? Any more questions from the audience here? I was just, I was listening to the comment that you were making about the perch being deeper. I'm wondering, do, do you think that could have to do with the temperature of the water and that they're looking for those cooler temperatures? It could. So there, there was a study that showed that I think since 1960, the river has warmed up 1.3 degrees Celsius. So the river is warming. Uh, the perch are actually warm water species, so they don't mind. 
um, that warmer temperature. The northern pike are cool water species, so that's going to, you know, that climate change is going to have a big effect on those cool water species, I think. But it, it could be, it could be like the, the deeper water. I'll have to think about that one a little bit. Maybe one final thought here. Uh, have you given any thought to the seaway at all? Or have you spoken with anyone with the seaway authority? Because uh, I know quite a few people that work there and they're regulating basically the ship speeds going through and also the water levels. They have some say in it. And with the, the ship traffic going back mm -hmm. and forth and, and the erosion from the shore yeah. that we've seen basically in our areas where the government is not willing to shore up the shorelines unless they're islands, where they've protected the islands. Mm -hmm. But a lot of those shorelines are being eroded as well, which is taking away more of that habitat for these fish. Yeah, yeah, I know. And it, it is a huge problem. I think we all know that the seaway has not only affected our shorelines, but it's brought in a lot of invasive species into the river. Mm -hmm. um, we have a project right now at the River Institute where we're looking at that shoreline erosion versus wake speed. So like all those big waves that the, the ships are doing, how much is that eroding of the river? So hopefully you guys stay tuned and you know, we're in the process of doing that, that project right now. Um, so we should have some you know, findings for you in the next year or two, I think. Yeah. But it, that's a big point. Yeah, there's just one little thing that I do know that many people don't. They'll go faster and pay the fine because it's cheaper than not getting the car. So a lot of this game is being played with these big ships where the pilots are actually speeding past their allowable limit and willing, the companies are willing to pay the fine because it's cheaper yeah. than the... I'm, I'm saddened to tell you that, that you know my experience as a scientist is been, I've seen that through a lot of different sectors and you know money talks and it's mm -hmm. it's not right I don't think but it's the reality that we live in so we do need to push this policy you know we do as a community need to get together and, and ask for some different policies around some of these things because they're not working the way that that they're said right now and it's not just you know the ships it's a lot of different things oh, yeah. yeah different topic from the seaway but we had a lot of industry when I was a child, you know, that dumped things in the water that, you know, just totally wiped out our vegetation. So, well, we used to do soup fishing, but more, because the vegetation was just absolutely gone. Mm -hmm. You can look down 30 feet and see the bottom. Mm -hmm. So, if the vegetation was gone, the species still either ate it or feed on mm -hmm. crustaceans or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's come back. We've, we've seen the vegetation come back, but maybe it would be, like you said, with more cattail. Yeah, it's not the same. It's a yeah. basic, you know, and it's just... Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, you know, like I said, the river is changing, and um, the, the good thing about the industry is that the river is a lot better than it used to be in the 70s and the 80s. Our, our contaminant loads are going down. The industries have, a lot of them have, you know, closed, so I think we could... Be happy, you know, that the river is resilient and strong and it, it is going to, you know, it has bounced back from, from those years of industrial contamination. There is still a legacy effect, though, and we do need to keep our eye on it because it still is affecting the people along the river and the species in the river, too. So we do have a set of contaminant indicators uh, that hopefully we'll be start, starting to work on this year. So maybe by next year we could give you, you know, some of the lowdown on, on what's going on with the contaminants. But yeah, that's it's a really good point. But what we've been told growing up is under four inches of sediment there's a lot of mercury. Yeah, there is. Anybody that wants to build along the shorelines, it becomes a huge issue. You don't want to stir up. Yeah, you don't want to stir it up. Yeah. So there's different approaches to to the contamination pro problem and the, the Cornwall sediment strategy is to just try to bury that contaminated sediment because when you stir it up, you're resuspending that mercury in the water. So the strategy that we've taken for the, that not we, but the government has taken, you know, for the area is to just, to just leave it be. And yeah, it is a problem when you do stir it up. So it's, it's hard though, like it's, do you dredge it out and stir it up 
it, it's, it is very tricky and I do have confidence that, you know, we are, the scientists are doing a good job with, with some of that stuff, but it's, it's tricky. I'm, I'm not an ecotoxicologist, but um, yeah, it, it did have a big, the industry had a huge impact, as you guys know, on the river and the people around the river. Just recently, we had a huge proposal. It's, it's being expressed to the community. Everybody knows this company, DevCorp, who's bought NavCam, and now they're proposing to build something that actually looks like a Y-Tech, a hotel that's right in the water, but if Joe wants to build his house and put a dock mm -hmm. in, he can't, but how can these large projects be allowable? You know what I mean? It's yeah. Like it's frustrating. Yeah, it's frustrating. But the, the thing with that is that those those companies still do have to do an environmental impact assessment and everybody, you know, there is a say in that in that process. So you have to keep your eye on that project. You have to be you know, you have to do the work to really keep it in make sure that you're keeping up with that project because if no one says anything it's gonna happen, right? So, yeah, it's. We have some Facebook questions, I think. Um, oh, yeah. Does the Grass River uh, contamination be affecting the St. Lawrence River? Do you know of that? Yeah, I'm, I probably am not the best person to answer this question. Um, does anyone from the River Institute that are, is on that project in the back want to answer? Does does the contamination in the Grassy River affect the the St. Lawrence River? Well, I think we have an expert here. I'm still waiting on data sets back from the government in order to tell whether that has occurred. Um, the engineering studies that were put out by the US um, indicate our that it was a closed system based oh <laughs> so uh i've been trying to study this and i've been waiting on data to come back from um the ministry of environmental conservation and protection and so uh we've been waiting on that data for a minute but um i basically i developed this where we we attacked this uh, study together because we were concerned about fish south of Cornwall Island and within the St. Lawrence leading into the um, Jishnine wetland complex of being exposed to PCBs from the Grass River um, because they made a lot of assumptions in um, the design of the cleanup of the Grass River and I think some of those assumptions may be flawed and so I'm trying to do, we were trying to do that research to be able to show whether there was an increase due to the dredging that occurred there. Um, but we don't have our data back yet. And so that's kind of difficult and a kind of a product of COVID's influence on our ability to do research during this time because labs were shut down. Um, and so I'm really intrigued to what these numbers are going to actually look like when we finally get the data back, which may be telling because we were able to test for total mercury and total PCBs, which in itself isn't going to give us like super detailed knowledge about um, different kinds of PCBs because there's something like 230 different kinds. Um, but all I can say is we're, we're doing our best to address this and we're carrying um, those concerns with us and going to share that information when, when it becomes available. But I think even within this presentation and me and Marianne have talked so much about this, the importance of collaborating across these political boundaries. Um, because this wasn't funding because the Grass River is in the United States and so jurisdictionally um, because I worked for Mohawk Council we weren't that wasn't our jurisdiction that was the St. Regis Mohawk tribe's responsibility to oversee that but we were able to get funding by acknowledging a data gap south of Cornwall Island so it continues to open up this conversation about the importance of collaboration with indigenous communities, collaborations across these political boundaries, um, which ultimately ends up being this really big conversation about how things are limited across boundaries. So the areas of concern actually end as soon as you reach the Quebec border. 
And now we're starting to open conversations with ECCC, EPA to consider what is that, does that make even any sense if we're going to do ecosystem approaches to um, management? But no, this is exactly like the issue right now is it takes us time to research things because as soon as we get the data, then we have to process it and make sense of it. Um, and then we're going to like end up, I don't know, and I'm concerned, um, but I'm hopeful that maybe these assumptions were accurate, um, that a lot of brilliant people put their minds and energies into this report. But like anything, science has its barriers and it has its issues and and sometimes it isn't going to be correct on, on everything. But it, I think that we can't stop making decisions on what we need to do for the environment just based on uncertainties of things that we haven't measured or haven't been able to measure. So, I mean, that's my approach to it. Um, and that's the work that I've been involved in, And that's kind of the work that I'm going to continue to do that's about keeping an eye on the environment because not just the legacy contaminants that are there. We also have like emerging contaminants that we need to be concerned about and measuring for, such as PFAS or microplastics. And what does that look like on its influence? Um, because all of like, at the very core, the River Rapport is committed to looking at the ecosystem as a whole and us as a people that are connected to the ecosystem as well and how we're related to each other. And that's why the Ohanda Galiwadakwa or the Thanksgiving Address was such a great framework to hang such a magnificent report and research on. And I think it's just going to keep continuing for a very, very long time and hopefully and definitely be to see the value in the data and the work that we're able to accomplish, you know, with this small but mighty team of researchers and collaborators in this area. So I don't know. I just want to say I'm such a big fan of Marianne's work <laughs> and excited to continue to do this. So now. Thank you, Abe. I'm such a big fan of your work, too. So, <laughs> you know, yeah, this project is really it's for you guys. Right. Like we don't have an agenda like our agenda is to just address your concerns and do it the best that we can and do it, you know, with the people of the river. So I hope that you guys enjoyed the presentation today and I hope it gives you some things to think about. I have my business card is in the back. If you guys think of any questions when you leave, you could grab one. My email's on it. Um, it's by the coffee. So, oh yes. I have one more question. Do you think that because we have a, a lot of less snow, it's affecting the farming? Yeah, well, that that's a really good question and I, I don't know if I could give you a good answer on it, but definitely has an effect um you know the snow does insulate in a sense right so so when you're removing that snow cover it it does you know it has an effect on the animals in the river i just i can't give you a good answer as to what that effect is maybe brian could could you jump in here or but you said like uh, it floods in the springtime oh yes yeah, so, so the flooding, yeah, if you don't have snow, you're going to have less runoff. The thing about the river, though, like, the dam really controls all of the water levels. Like, this is something that the humans have pretty full control over. So if we wanted it to flood, you know, the dam, they can control the water levels to, to make it flood, but it's not economically and, I guess, operationally um, what they're doing right now. So the snow runoff does have an effect. Maybe not so much on the river because we have so much control over the water levels, but all the tributaries around the river, too, it, you know, that does affect the flow in those tributaries. So I do think it has an effect. I just I don't know what the extent of that effect is. But I'll, I'll try to do a little research for next time. Okay, good for you. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't have all the answers, <laughs> but I will think about it. I'll think about it, though. Once that snow melts, um, all the land, all the land around here is tile drained, so it just flows right off out of those creeks and into the river, and then the creek beds are dry um, in a few weeks. I mean, just look at the Raisin River; they do the canoe race, and two weeks later, you can walk across the uh, the rapids. Yeah, so it's heavily managed uh, the flow around here. <laughs> is there any other questions? Just one, uh, yeah. 
Is anyone been uh, sampling for mercury content in the first, like for eating, uh, what would be a healthy, allowable intake of yellow perch? As I, I know that when we got stopped often for surveys and just checking what we were catching, I, I'm not sure, I, th I think it was the River Institute that was just having the people go by. They were telling us that the, the, they were much healthier as far as contaminants. I don't know mm -hmm. if that was just... Yeah, so there is an ongoing program that, that looks at that contamination uh, burden in the fish. We, it is so much better than what it used to be, but it, there's still some work to do with the contaminant levels. We will look into that, like we have our set of contaminant indicators, so we have contamination in yellow perch and northern pike, herring gulls, invertebrates, and sediments. So that's our set that we, and fish in general too. So that's the set that we have, and I, I um, there are pro, uh, projects and you know the River Institute does do some sampling for that with with MCA so there's ongoing projects and you know they are keeping a close eye on on the contaminant loads with the resources that are available yes and so to further up to that question uh, are you working with Health and Welfare Canada in so far as, as combining your your data uh, mercury contamination and fish or, or what have you um so okay so probably Jeff or I know Abe does some work on that too, but someone that is doing that, that project will have a better answer for you. One sec. Yeah, hi, Jeff Reidel with uh, River Institute. Uh, so we've done a lot of work over the years with mercury and all of uh, in fish and any of the work we do with mercury and fish, get, we get it in reports that go to the Ministry of the Environment, uh, Conservation and Parks, the Ontario, and, and they are the ones that put out the fish eating guide, eat, guide to eating Ontario fish. And so that data gets worked into the reports. They use the um, uh, Health Canada's guidelines, but they're the, really the, the, the ones that are responsible for establishing those guidelines. But there is actually a, quite a lot of um, <clears throat> work going on right now that's sort of in that fermenting stage around fish uh, consumption guidelines, and particularly uh, in terms of working with our partners at MCA. So Abe is smiling again because there's a lot kind of in the pipeline, but those reports, unfortunately, are not ones that are out right yet. Uh, but we have a big workshop coming up in about a couple, well, geez, it's close now. Yeah, so we're having all of the, like the IJC people and experts coming together at Aquasasne to talk about uh, fish guidelines because one of the biggest issues is that if you're from Aquasasne, you've got uh, New York guidelines, you've got Quebec guidelines, you've got Ontario guidelines, you've got St. Regis Tribe guidelines, so who do, you, who do you talk to? So that's one of the things that we're also trying to get an eye uh, handle on. So sorry Abe, I don't know if I should be getting all into that, but that's, that's a little bit of what this guy's working on quite a bit. Your guidelines that you're following, are, are you working also in collaboration with Health and Welfare Canada with all your like, agencies that you mentioned? Because I used to work with Health and Welfare yeah. Canada and we never had any, anything to do with fishy work. No, I mean, they established the Canadian guidelines uh, and then it goes to the Ontario province. And I actually don't know whether our province, Ontario, uh, the ministry people working with Health Canada in that sort of level. Um, and... Um, I, uh, so not, we're not working specifically, but I think uh, there are some people that tend to at University of Ottawa that work closely with Health Canada. So I, I can't answer it in full, in full detail, but uh, mostly we're working with Ontario on that. Thanks, Jeff. So any other questions? Maybe one more. Yes, what sir. What is the expectancy of a perch? So the per eight or nine years. That is. Yeah, so I, based on the data that we have, it seems like most of them are between like up to seven years a majority, but there was some caught that were 11 years old. So in, the, in Lake St. Francis. So I think they could live up to, you know, a, a certain age, maybe 11 or maybe more. But most of them are, you know, I think around seven-ish. But, you know, they, they reach sexual maturity between two to four based on on if it's a male or female, so they, they'll have a few years there to reproduce. 
And one last thing, I promise. Yeah. <laughs> Shut up, man. I promise. Okay. But your recommendation of the limits, like I understand it makes sense with just the numbers you see. But I find it's not, I think the, the better point would be slot size. Mm -hmm. So perch over, let's say, 11 and a half or 12 inches to return to the river because they're your spawners. Mm -hmm. And my cousin Mitch, that runs that pipe turn, we've often talked about this where we, we see each other let them go. Like you, you see, catch a 13 or 14 inch perch, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's those are your reproductive perch, the ones that'll have the most eggs. Mm -hmm. So I think for a recommendation, there should be a slot size, of make a maximum, let's say 12 inch or 11 yeah. inch perch and everything else goes back. But yeah, that's that's a really fantastic point. And you know, like I guess it's it's a little bit different with perch than other mm -hmm. fish. Like when you think about walleye, you catch a big female, you're gonna put her back, you know. Right. But I guess we gotta like as fishermen, we gotta have that same mentality for perch, because uh, you know our, we do have to think about our perch a little bit more here and and be more aware of what we're taking out of the river and maybe not you know keep keep those big perch even though they're they're so tasty. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you do a lot of perch fishing, you know if it's a female that's got eggs in it. But today, completely different. The three perch that I cleaned, the sacks, the eggs were that size. Never seen that before at this time of the year. Mm -hmm. Usually in the spring, maybe. Yeah. But not not at this time of the year. So what's the yeah. reason for that? Are they changing their yeah, uh, honestly, that's a good point, Em. If you could take that down, I I don't I can't give you an answer. But but you know all these little things that you guys are noticing when you're out there, they're really good to you know write down the date and and what you've seen and send me an email with it because uh, I'll look into it. Yeah, you know it's great. I'll, I'll look into it and I'll, I'll see if I could help. Like you know I'm not the know all and just read a lot. But I love talking. Like it's great to talk to you guys because like you know. Like in school, I learned a lot, but I learned more from my dad and like just being out with him on the land and stuff. So I, I know the value of people who've been here their whole life and see changes. Um, uh, I, yeah. I've been on the river since I'm three years old. Yeah. That uh, Cooper's Marsh, and he can vouch for that. Mm -hmm. uh, that's all land that was my ancestors, my grandfather, great grandfather, and whatnot. And I want to, I'd like to know. This is a, this is a problem. Is the channel cat? I want to know how old that would be. That weighed forty four pounds. Like I threw oh. it back here. How old would that be? That's a. That's big. That's a big channel cat. <laughs> that's really big. Um, a forty four pound pound channel cat. Anyone have an idea of how old that would be? That's old. Yeah. That's old. You gotta be a good fisherman. It's probably it's only eight, eight pound test line. Yeah, you gotta be a good fisherman to catch that. <laughs> no, that's great. But yeah, I just I, I really you know, hopefully now that the restrictions have eased up a bit we could do more things like this and I could talk to you guys more and grab grab my card in the back if you have any more questions or just have anything you wanna tell me and I'll I'll keep track of that stuff. So thank you guys so much for coming. I really appreciate you guys being here. And I hope, you know, that we can continue this conversation about Perch and Pike and uh, keep this discussion going. So thank you guys a lot. And I'll just take a quick word to thank Marianne for taking the time to come and present her research to us. She has been an investigator. Uh, it's taken a long time. So thank you, Marianne, for that. Uh, and everybody online, thank you for your comments. I'll pass them on to Marianne. Uh, Marianne. We'll put her email in, uh, in the comment section in case you have any more questions uh, about this presentation. So thank you, everybody, and see you hopefully in November. <laughs>